not good. It's not good. The writing is terrible. We have the classic, um, she let out of breath, she didn't know she was holding Welcome to Tom, my name is Sam, and today I'm going to be talking to you about some books. And those books specifically, as you probably see from the side of me, um, are some very popular books on both booktube and bookcock. So this video is probably going to get me murdered. <laughs> um, but I read A Court of Thousand Roses for this video. I was going to read the whole series, but then I was starting uni again and I thought I, I just can't be bothered just now. So I'm going to just stick with the first book, do a video on that see where we go from there and i i didn't like this book i i went in with an open mind i just read throne of glass which i have videos on as well so check those out those are a more positive review but i i enjoyed throne of glass it had its cringy moments but it was enjoyable so i kind of went into this with the same mindset i was like oh okay i'm going to read this book and it's going to be cringy but it's going to be at least entertaining it, this book wasn't. Uh, now, for non-spoilery, I can't really say much, but I will say, I just, the main driving point of this book was so contrived. The entire, like, villain um, and kind of situations that were brought up were so contrived. They did not need to happen. There was no reason why 90% of this book happened other than for the plot. The characters were so bland. There was two characters I liked, which I'll get onto in the spoilery part. Um, they were Lucian and Rysand. And they were the only interesting characters. And even then, I didn't really like one of them. And I'll get into that in the spoiler a bit. But the main plot of this book is basically it's a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It kind of follows our Katniss Everdeen, oh sorry, Feyre, um, as she kind of finds herself being taken to this magical land. Basically at the start of the book we are introduced to her hunting in a forest, Katniss Everdeen. And she kills a deer, she kills a wolf, who we later find out is a fae. Um, and she kills the wolf and she skins it. And she sells that and then Tamlin, this high fae, comes to her door, bashes it down, is like, right, who killed my mate? I'm going to kill you. Or, according to these ancient laws, put in place millions of years ago, and this is all we're going to tell you about these laws, you can come live in my lavish estate. And so... But, okay, we can either kill you or you can come live a lovely life in my mansion for the rest of your life in Feyland and you can have all the food you want, you can do whatever the hell you want. I wonder which one Feyre picked. I wonder which one she picked. She goes off to this Feyland and we spend 90% of the book with this kind of tacky Beauty and the Beast kind of retelling where she's fallen in love with the guy that's literally just kidnapped her. The worst Stockholm Syndrome I've ever seen literally okay i don't think this is a spoiler this doesn't count as a spoiler but the, the chapter that i just mentioned where he comes in and takes her the exact chapter after that she's already like oh but he's kind of hot like i kind of like this guy like his hair his eyes his body and she's already falling in love with him and she's already forgotten her like uh well they were kind of like not very nice people but uh she has two sisters and a kind of crippled kind of father who she was um, providing for, and she just immediately forgets about them. She thinks about them once or twice, like, oh no, what, what's going to happen to them? Oh, I promised I'd look after them. But wow, this guy's so hot, I'm going to go with him. I'm like, he just kidnapped you. And and even then, like, Tamlin is also no better. He immediately is starting flirting, openly flirting with Feyre, and it's just like, it's so whitwashy. One second he's like, I'm literally going to kill you and gut you like a fish. And then the next chapter and the few chapters after that, he's like, oh my god. So I'm so brooding. I'm not like the other way. But that is mainly this book. And it is not good. It's not good. The writing is terrible. We have the classic, um, she let out a breath. She didn't know she was holding line. We have like, oh, my bones ache to see pressed against me and that kind of stuff and it's just uh, I don't know of things to say in this non spoilery part so I think we'll just get into spoilers if you still want to read this book see if you like it go ahead click off now see if you like it if you read this book and you want to hear my rant about it if you haven't read the book but you don't want to and you want to hear my rant stick around <laughs> 
okay so for this spoilery section i'm kind of just going to bounce off my thoughts because they're kind of i i finished this last night uh, so they're all just kind of teeming around in my head so i'm just gonna bounce off one thought from the other but i'll try and keep it organized in some way um so well i guess we'll talk about Feyre to begin with Feyre is what i have now coined the three d's she's dumb dull and delusional she is just the most like bland main character you could ever imagine like Triss from uh, Divergent but worse she has no personality other than oh I'm not like other girls and oh I like to paint sometimes and even with the painting we don't really get any in-depth description about any of those paintings we're just told there's colours on the painting and she likes the colours and she has the typical like oh I can never capture this in my paintings uh, kind of situation so that's basically her personality is blandness and I like to paint that's her entire personality she is constantly ignoring people so we'll have like pages and pages of people telling her um stuff and she'll just ignore it like we have a part nearer the end where Alice is like okay so basically this is what's going down they're all under the mountain uh you don't don't make any deals with anyone when you go because you'll get trapped into something don't drink and stuff like that we have 13 pages of Alice explaining all these rules and things that Feyre needs to do to make sure she's safe and she needs to work them into her plan and Feyre just goes in immediately gets captured immediately makes a deal and it's just what was the point in those 13 pages that we had to read of Alice explaining what not to do if you were just going to make Feyre do it anyway uh, she's dumb for that she's dull because she has no personality and she's delusional because she is basically this human. She has no special abilities other than being able to hunt. She she has no experience and she comes into this world that's crumbling. And there's this Blight, which is the villain who is early on personified. The Blight is supposed to be this ambiguous thing. Um, but it's very easy to guess that the Blight is a person. And the person's taking all the magic away from the land and controlling everyone. It's very easy to guess that. She basically thinks she can defeat the Blight that no other high fae with all these magical powers like shape-shifting and mind manipulation none of those people can defeat it but Feyre, our teenage girl here, can defeat this of course she can, this is a YA novel she's gonna have no issue killing this, this blight that no one else on the continent can defeat okay, sure sure <laughs> Also, one little thing that I want to pluck out of Feyre as a character is she basically, we're shown she grows up uh, impoverished. She is not in a great situation. She's having to hunt to keep her family afloat and she's kind of not doing great. But then when she gets to this lavish mansion and then there's all these servants that are having to work to her every need and will and giving her all this stuff and just being servants, she has no empathy or sympathy for any of them. Like, she grew up poor. Yet she, as soon as these servants come and start taking care of her, she's like, oh, I'm living the life. This is for me. So there's no really inspection into that kind of element of her character. As I mentioned previously, we have this blight, which is initially shown to be this kind of ambiguous um, force that is draining all the magic from this land and kind of oppressing everyone. Um, but it's really early personified and it's like the blight is cruel like that like obviously the blight is going to be a woman you have a world full of magical people you've even told us about this evil dictator on the island across from us of course the person uh, is going to be oppressing the magic it's not going to be a random force um so that was very early on kind of predictable that it was going to be a person um and yeah she was very cartoonish she was the most cartoonish villain i've ever read like all her plans are so unnecessary and so contrived and precise that they just don't make sense and it's really hard to follow her logic for why she's actually doing any of this um we get to that end part where we're under the mountain she has tamlin where she wants him in prison she has everyone where she wants them in prison and yet she still gives favor the chance to rescue everyone and then obviously she would immediately die after that but she still gives Feyre the chance to prove she loves Tamlin enough to what like you have everything you want you have everyone enslaved why are you giving this girl a chance to undo all your hard work 
Um, so she gives Feyre these three trials. One is to fight a worm, one's to pull a lever for a riddle, and the other one, I can't remember what the other one was to be fair. Um, and then she has those three trials, and it's like, you do these three trials, everyone will free. I'll free everyone, you'll be good. Secretly, she's not going to free them until they're all dead. That's kind of like the precise point. Fair enough. But then she gives favour this loophole where she's like, oh, I'm also going to give you a riddle. And if you can solve this riddle, I'll free everyone immediately. Why? Why? Why not just kill her? Earlier on, Feyre gave her a fake name uh, when her lieutenant, Rysand, came and asked for, uh, found her and asked for her name and she gave a fake name. And then we see that that person that Feyre named is now in that under that mountain, flayed and dead and tortured. Why is she not doing that to Feyre now that she's just wandered into the mountain? Why is she giving Feyre the chance to free everyone and be the hero? Just just kill her. She's walked into your lair. Just kill her like you did with the other innocent girl. It makes no sense. So, of course, Feyre does all these trials. She even cheats in some of them with Rysand, who I haven't talked about him. I'll go a bit more in detail on him in a minute. But she gives Feyre these trials, and one of them is to read read, like riddles so like two riddles you have the riddle that just undoes everything and lets her win automatically and then she has this second trial which is pull a lever for the correct answer to a riddle and her favorite is illiterate she can't read obviously she grew up poor she never had the chance to learn how to read um so she has this tattoo with Rysan, which i'll explain in a minute and she basically cheats and just he makes her feel pain on the wrong answers so she pulls the right one when she doesn't feel any pain so she cheats on that no that was an that was clearly an opportunity for Feyre to grow trying to figure it out on her own but now of course she has someone else come and help her along because this is boring um so yeah two riddles why could you not think of another trial there's one where she fought a giant worm like all, all three trials were completely irrelevant to any overarching themes of the novel there's a giant worm she's like oh kill kill this giant worm and it's like okay what does that have to do with like forbidden love beauty on the inside that kind of stuff that comes with the beauty and the beast retelling and it's like no just just kill this worm with some broken bones that makes sense and then answer this riddle and pull a lever yes Oh, and the answer to that, the riddle I mentioned where it's like, oh, answer this and I'll free everyone, the, like, loophole section. The answer is love. It's like, oh, what is twisted, broken, blah, 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 riddle. And, and at the very end, when she's failed the trials, because of course she was going to fail the trials, um, she's like, oh, the answer's love. And it's just so cringe. It's one of those moments where you just you just shake your head, look at the book in disappointment, and just throw it across the room. Like it's so stupid. It's literally the worst kind of like tropey kind of thing where that's like the answer all along was love. Like could you not any other answer? Any other answer to that riddle would have been more interesting than the answer's love. And why would she choose love? The whole villain's thing is that she um, she wanted Tamlin to find love with the thing. So why would you make love the thing? That's so obvious. Make it something... Like, you want Feyre to die. She wants Feyre to die. So why not make the riddle impossible for her to guess? Why give her the riddle? But, like, if you're going to give it her, why make it so easy to guess? It's just so contrived. It makes no sense. Um, The answer's love the answer was love all along she deserved to die for that she dies but then everyone brings her back and now she's a high fae just like throne of glass the main character is a fae so yeah <laughs> but in this one it's even more contrived at least with the other one she knew she was a fae and it was a plot point along with this one she's just like all oh, she dies and then all these high fae are like here have some magic drops and she comes back alive as a high fae well, great, thanks. You should have just left it out. Before I go on to Lucian, I'm going to talk about Resand because he kind of fits in with what I was just talking about. But basically, Resand is this intimidating character who was actually one of the two characters that I liked. He was in his first introduction was very intimidating. He was very much like the Darkling from Shadow and Bone, um, who I didn't like, but in this one it kind of works. Um, 
but he was very much like the dark thing kind of character where it's like this dark brooding evil character and I thought he was very intimidating when he first showed up they're kind of hiding favor from him and he finds her and he obviously f finds the fake name she gave him and flays that person but he was very intimidating he had a really good presence I think she did uh Mass did a very good job writing him in that kind of position of being this intimidating morally ambiguous character and he was actually rather interesting and later on he he gets a bit more screen time he's like the lieutenant of Ar Aramanthia the main villain and um, I'm looking at my notes um and he's her lieutenant but he doesn't want to be he's kind of like enslaved so he's using all these people as kind of like a chessboard to try and get out of this situation for himself um which was very interesting because unlike Feyre unlike Tamlin unlike Lucian Rysan had something going on he had a plan he was actively moving the plot and trying to do something whereas everyone else is just kind of floating around being dumb so I like Rysan in that sense and I thought he would be a very inter uh, very interesting villain although at the end of Kingdom of Ash I was watching a review for that once I'd finished it and they mentioned, oh, it was right and Feyre at the end. And then obviously Feyre is pregnant at the end of that book. So now I kind of know that Feyre and Rysand are going to end up together. Unless, I, I, unless I'm unless misremembering what that reviewer said. Um, but I think they pretty much end together, which I'm not really, nice, I'm not really, I'm not really happy with. I do not ship Feyre with Rysand in the slightest. He is very abusive and manipulative. He basically pimps her out. He drugs her and gives her like this tattoo on her hand, which is like an eye, which is very shadow huntery with the eye on the back of the hand and all the tattoo stuff. Um, and he gives her that and he basically owns her for two nights every month, I think it was. Already just weird, 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 weird. Um, I mean, it would be okay for a villain, I guess, because it would be very villainous, but knowing that he's going to be the main love interest going forward, is very concerning um and not only does he permanently scar her hand with these tattoos he pimps her out so basically when he tells her to do stuff she's kind of drugged up and she doesn't really have any control of her body and he makes people like touch her and he makes her do lap dances and dresses her very scantily and stuff like that and with this tattoo on her hand that spreads across the body he can see where people have touched her and who has touched her and it's very, very, I just, no, it's gross. It's gross and it's abusive and it's manipulative and I hate it. Knowing that he's going to be a love interest, no, just, just no, okay. Um, and basically his main goal with this is to anger Tamlin so that Tamlin will kill Aramanthia when he's freed. But the thing is, Rysan's Ry reasoning does not make sense. Tamlin is already enraged. Tamlin would already want to kill Aramanthia. He's sacrificed a lot of his friends. Um, he, his whole court's in prison. He's in prison. His love interest is being currently being tortured by the villain. Why does Rysan then have to add to that to pimp her out? It makes no sense. Like, why make Tamlin mad at you as well? Just let him be mad at Aramanthia. He doesn't need to be mad at you as well, Rysan. That was kind of dumb. Um, yeah, that made no sense. Okay, so that's Rysan. I liked him as a villain. I really, really disagree with him being a love interest and potentially the end game. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but then moving on to Lucian, he was the other character that I kind of liked. He was a bit more interesting. He had a bit more to him. He was very sassy. He, he was inconsistent, just like Tamlin with the kind of like his best friend just got murdered and skinned. But he immediately kind of forgives Feyre. He's still that kind of consistent, uh, inconsistent. Um, but he was he was kind of he kind of gradually forgave her. Like it was immediately like oh okay. And he adds a bit of sass. And when Rysand and Feyre are having their flirty moments, he is very sassy about it. And I was like, that's me. That's me. I'm Lucian. <laughs> I don't like this either. But yeah, he kind of personified the. Uh, feelings I was having about their relationship where I was like oh just stop already 
Um, so that's why it kind of like Lucian and he kind of did move the plot along with telling her to go after Well, he didn't tell her, he told her how to go after this monster, which was completely irrelevant in the long run. I've completely forgot what it was even called, but it was like this fade that you can capture and it'll tell you the truth no matter what. He basically had to do that, but I can't even remember what that came to in the end. He was like, don't trust them or something like that. So Lucian was another character that I liked. And when I say liked, it's a low bar. Like, he was bearable. That's what I mean by liked. Um, and then Tamlin is obviously a very inconsistent. He goes from wanting to gut her like a fish to fall in love with her and openly flirting with her and taking her on picnics and giving her a gallery to paint in. And I know later on it's revealed that he's trying to make her fall in love with him. But for the 90% of this book, when we didn't know that, I was just so annoyed because I was like, she's skinned your best friend. She's skinned your friend. Why are you falling in love with her? Why is she falling in love with you? You kidnapped her. So for the night spent of the book, when we didn't know this was Tamlin's end game plan to make her fall in love with him, it just made no sense. And I was constantly just <laughs> berating my friends with like, this makes no sense. Please explain this to me. And hearing them be like, what the heck is happening in this book? Um, but yeah. And then even when we get the context of Tamlin is trying to make her fall in love with him, he the, the way he goes about it is so weird like if you were trying to make her fall in love with you why did tamlin go get her initially why not send lucian because tamlin going to get her he gave her a terrible first impression he broke down her front door threatened to kill her family threatened to kill her like that's not how you make good first impressions with someone you want to date okay like that's not a great first date finding love isn't easy <laughs> And that first date is always daunting. Why not send Lucian to get her? Then she has a bad impression of Lucian, which she already has anyway. But like, she'd have a bad impression of Lucian and then you could kind of like swoop in and act like this high lord that's kind of nice to her. That would have made more sense. Honestly, that would have made more sense. Oh, and then one more thing I want to bring up with Tamlin is... I hate to end this video on, like, a terrible note, but Tamlin is very rapey. Like, there's a scene, he's doing this ritual thing, I can't remember what that was all about, because it didn't lead to anything, but it was trying to find, like, Tamlin's mate, um, is in love, not as in, hey mate, how you doing? Um, but he's very, he, he comes in after the ritual and he's had sex with another girl because he couldn't find Feyre. And Feyre is in the hallway coming out of her room, which she'd told not, been told not to leave, but she's in the hallway and he pushes her up against the wall. He, even when she's saying, no, let me go, both physically and verbally, he doesn't let her go. And he even bites her neck, scarring her and leaving this mark on her. It's just, and his nails like dig into the wall, clasping her onto the wall. It was very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable and it was very terrible. Like she forgives him later on. Like she goes, oh, it's fine later on. But in that moment, she was saying no. She was both verbally saying no and physically saying no, trying to get him off of her. And he still pressed up against her. He still bit her and pressed up against the wall. Like that was very rapey and manipulative and abusive. And he is also a love interest. Why are both the love interests abusive? why it makes no sense and it was so uncomfortable to read I, if this is the future of the love interest of this series i don't know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna have to jump out of the window um that was really uncomfortable and i hate Tamlin. um he's mainly bland he's he is the personification of watching paint dry he's so bland he has nothing to a character so i guess it kind of fits with favor they both have no personality basically this book bad I will be reading the rest of them just because I want to make videos on them and share my thoughts. Um, and obviously I want to read my physical TBR, but I think I'm only going to read these, this one, A Court of Mist and Fury and A Court of Wings and Ruin, and then A Court of Frost and Salah, which is just like a short story. I'm not going to read the most newest one because I don't own it. I only want to read these because I own them and I want to make it worth having them, uh, of having them. Um, but yeah. In the future, I'll have videos for all these books. I'll have videos for all those books in the future. At some point, whether soon or not soon, we'll see, depending on uni. But I hope you like this video, even if I even if I said things you didn't agree with. I hope you at least enjoyed the video, enjoyed the rant. 
I will never be rereading this. I don't think I'll read any more Sarah J Maas after this series. So yeah. <laughs> I hate this book. I really wanted to like it. I really wanted it to be like Throne of Glass where it was cringy but enjoyable. But it just wasn't. I didn't enjoy it in the slightest. And it just sucks. And I, I don't understand the hype. It's so badly written. The characters are so inconsistent. I don't see what people like about it. I don't see. So... In my opinion, it's not worth the hype it has on TikTok and YouTube and all that. But to each their own. If you enjoy Throne of, Gla Throne of Glass, if you enjoy A Court of Thorns and Roses, good on you. I'm happy you find something to love about it. I'm happy that it makes you happy to read. But personally for me, it just wasn't. It wasn't it. So if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, a comment. Let me know what your thoughts were on Throne of Glass. If you completely disagree with me, let me know why. Um, if you agree with me, I'd like to hear some support. So yeah, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.